by the end of the last episode we finally had a reasonably solid way of writing down rhythm, both for single notes and ligatures. Those are ligatures. We briefly glanced at model notation when we read note values dictated by the modes created by Frank of Cologne or Johannes de Garlandia. We saw how everything was ruled by a perfection, how important that was, a perfectio, three tempore, or three half beats. It seemed to work, yes, but it was far from simple. Now, what if I tell you it's going to get a lot more confusing still? Before the final pieces of the puzzle slide into place, it's going to get absolutely crazy. Along this journey, science will play its part, stationery will have a say as well, and someone must cut the umbilical cord to this perfection obsession, a burden that is slowing everyone down. Franco left clear instructions that others felt were very easy to follow. He was such a game changer that many music books from his time, the ones containing Motet especially, annotated in his way. Did Franco invent all this? Who knows? But his name stuck anyway, deservedly. Unlike Guido, Franco didn't come up with any new graphic bits, but he brought much needed law and order reinterpreting note shapes. Shapes didn't represent durations, and Franco must have thought, that's messed up. The solution's right there in front of you, lads. It's like bringing cans of Stella to a pub and then seeing the punters pour the beer onto their hands to drink it. Okay, here we are, 13th century, Magna Carta, Fourth Crusade is all the rage, the plague is still about 100 years away, and so far we have the longa, because of the long stem, who knows, which divides into three brevis, perfection, remember, which in turn divides into three or two semi-brevis, and the semi-brevis doesn't divide into anything smaller, yet. The anglicized names are exactly what you have today, but the note values are way off. That will change soon. Curiously, the shortest note where we are at the moment, the semi-brev, is the longest you are likely to encounter on a music score these days. Before we move on, I need to bring in two big players, as far as graphic figures are concerned, that shouldn't be left out in this story. In the blue corner, a bit of lightweight, as it will eventually fade out into obscurity, we have the plica, a spidery leg, sometimes two, going up or down, that transforms a note into two notes. Think of it as an ornamenting tone, sort of like a grace note, although some scholars say that's debatable. Well, when was the last time two of them agreed on anything? This ornamenting tone should be inserted between the note that has the plica and the next one. According to the direction of the dash, this new note is above or below the note with the plica. And now to the red corner, where we have the heavyweight of music notation, the silent giant of music notation, literally the silent one, the mighty rest. Another thing Franco helped clear up was how long rests last. In the beginning, obviously there was no great need. You can see breath marks scribbled at the end of a musical unit, so everyone took a big drag at the same time, but it was kind of optional. These marks sound like the title of a Dario Argento's movie, as they go by the lovely name of Suspirium. But tight singing would have been smooth enough. Once you got the train running, the text dictates the pace until everyone slams the brakes by the last syllable. Now, if you're gonna have independent voices, it'd be nice if some don't start straight away. Everyone loves a surprise, even God. Or if some come in and out, or maybe a long pause in one of the voices will encourage someone to join in with a musical instrument, God forbid. One beautiful type of piece that was quite popular back then was the hocket where voices take turns with consecutive notes or musical phrases. They alternate. You sing, I sing, he sings, I sing, and so on. Here's the beginning of a lovely one named In Seculum Longum. All those vertical lines you see, they're not bar lines, they're rests. The longer the line, the longer the rest. Today's rests are pretty straightforward, but these guys were pros. Why keep it simple? 
I know it's easy to criticize first attempt. There'd be nothing today if it wasn't for this lot. As expected, there wasn't a universally agreed system. Franco of Cologne did one way, Magister Lamberto said, well, at, at least both of these two were based on line length. Let's quickly glance over the broad strokes of Franco's system. So one space means one beat rest, well, actually one tempus, so as we now know, technically a quaver. Two spaces, two quavers, three spaces, three quavers, a perfection, and four spaces, still three quavers, but reserved for end of phrase. Why keep it simple? And what's this? One third of a space, two thirds of a space? Yeah, one third of a tempus, two thirds of a tempus. Must have been around this time that reading glasses were invented. And that was that. Back to measuring notes again. Fascination with measuring in the 14th century, measuring time, measuring motion, acceleration, very likely influenced the way music was being written down. Also, for the first time, European music ceased to aim at being the mirror image of the divine law and began to turn in other directions. Emotion, nature. We're about to leave the overbearing shadow of the Holy Trinity and the perfection, three, and venture into the quaternity, four, a number a lot more at home in nature and science. Think of the four seasons, the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. Think of the four humors, blood, phlegm, cholera and black bile, or as Gordon Ramsay calls it, breakfast. This is still where we are today. A minim divides into two crotchets, into four quavers, into eight semi-quavers. And so we enter the last leg of this relay race. The final runner to take up the baton is Philip de Vitry and his Ars Nova, a treatise that sorts note values in an ordered and understandable way, which is saying a lot as standards go in this labyrinthine mess. Pitch has been sorted since the times of good old Guido, but rhythm has been proving to be a pretty wild beast to tame. At the moment, in our tool bag, we have five notes, a duplex longer, a longer, a brevis, a semi-brevis, and we can pull up this stem on the semi-brevis to signal we have a mini semi-brevis. Semi-brevis mini, a semi-brevis minima. Much like we said about Franco of Cologne and nailing down rhythm, did Vitri invent a minim? Maybe not, but he was pretty instrumental in its adoption as a new rhythmic figure. These are the rough modern equivalent values as things stand. But remember, I said they will inflate. As new nodes were introduced in the 14th and 15th century, the existing ones proportionally slow down, for a handful of reasons. Look what happens. The names finally match. So now, according to Vitry, we are going to have four divisions, or prolations. This is the last time we talk about something resembling modes. I promise. But this one is very important. One of the divisions on this is almost like a time-space wormhole straight to where we are today. Philip came up with indications at the beginning of the piece to show you which division was being used. This was the unequivocal mother of the time signature. So these divisions are called prolations. Basically, perfect, imperfect, major and minor. Mix and match. How do you get to be perfect or major? As if you needed to ask. Good old, old Trinity, of course. Does it divide in three? If so, you get it. We now use one fourth of this 14th century chart as roadmap for most of our music writing. Funny that it had to be the one named Imperfect and Minor, the furthest away from holy values, but there you go. By the way, check out its symbol. Looks familiar as time signature? Yes. C for common time, 4-4. Four, four. On this prolation, unequivocally, one note divides into two of immediate shorter value, and that one into two of the next value below. Not a perfection in sight to complicate things. We still want them sometimes, though. But now we simply add a dot, or use one of these, so that three notes can fit into the space of two. Here's one of my favorite pieces with these indications in action. Guillaume de Marchaud's three-voice ballad, Beauté que tout autre père, Beauty equal to all others. 
You can see on the ten apart, there we go from the circle to the C and back to the circle. And it transcribes as this. Those changes in mensuration or time signature have the effect of displacing the tenor beat in relation to the other two voices, thus creating a gorgeous syncopation, quite popular in 14th century music. And here's where I leave you this time, with a curious fact about the fantastic composer of this last piece. Marshall was one of the first adopt maybe the first adopter of Philippe de Vitry's revolutionary prolations, seems to have composed music without giving much thought to what it sounded like. We know that sometimes he was happily surprised upon hearing one of his compositions for the first time, saying it pleased him. See you on the next one.